And that's what the Bible says. We'll be like Him. Amen. Let's have a little Bible study tonight, folks. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to um, to uh, the book of uh, uh, Acts chapter number uh, 10. Chapter 9, verse 1. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired to him desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And his response was, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now note carefully his encounter with God. This as a direct encounter with God. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, that it shall be told thee what thou must do. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy sweet name we pray. Amen. Now, I've told you before in the past that uh, Thomas Jefferson, one of the fathers of our country, brilliant mind. Thomas Jefferson was a very brilliant man, no question about it. And uh, uh, they found the Jefferson Bible, as I told you before. And in the Jefferson Bible, he had excised certain portions of the Scripture that he didn't believe belonged there. And he was going to present Jesus as he understood him. And so it's called the Jefferson Bible. It's uh, available. You can find it online, and you can see the places that he removed from the Scripture. But here's what he said about the Apostle Paul. He said he was one of the worst corruptors of the Christian faith. He called him a corrupter of the Christian faith. A few weeks ago, I brought you a message about how that they hate the Apostle Paul. I'm talking about present tense today. The haters of the Apostle Paul fall into into a number of categories. One of them is the category of the occult world. They hate him. The other category is these kingdom builders. They hate him. Another category would be those people who, uh, as the elite, as Thomas Jefferson, who feel like that it's their, uh, they have the authority to uh, remove vast portions of Scripture. They hate him. Why do people hate the Apostle Paul? Now, that's the uh, burden of my message tonight. Why do they hate him? I'm going to give you five reasons. These are five reasons that bear directly on what you believe tonight and are very important in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, number one, he never mentions the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul, not one time in any of his writings anywhere, makes one single reference to the kingdom of heaven. Though the Apostle Paul makes reference to the kingdom of God, he never makes one single reference to the kingdom of heaven. As I've said to you before, time and time again, I do not believe that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same thing. I do believe that there have been times that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven have run simultaneously on this earth. Yes, and and in a sense could be used interchangeably in reference to both of them. But as far as the identity of one and the identity of the other, there are two distinct different things. The kingdom of heaven is a visible, physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom that can only be entered in by the new birth. John chapter number 3. Except you be born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. The apostle Paul therefore makes no reference, not one single reference to the kingdom of heaven. Mark this in your book. A kingdom builder will kill you. Because all kingdom builders are building on this earth. 
Every kingdom builder has himself tied in with what's going on on planet earth. There are kingdom builders today who belong to areas like Joel's army, the manifest sons of God, all these late manifestations of God here on this earth, to subject and subdue the world to their authority. That's nothing new. The Roman Catholic Church for 2,000 years almost has been subjecting the world to their authority because they consider themselves to be the only true apostolic church. The Roman Catholic Church is a kingdom builder. Your eschatology, in other words, your doctrine of last things, from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, your eschatology will determine how you view the earth, how you view the Jew, how you view the governments of this world, and how you view each other. Eschatology is very important. As I've said to you before, I am premillennial. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back before the millennium. I am pre-tribulation rapture. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and He's going to catch us up to meet Him in the clouds before the time of Jacob's trouble that He talks about in the book of Jeremiah, which is a span of seven years. I am pre-tribulation and I am uh, premillennial. That doesn't mean that a brother or a sister could be post-millennial, amillennial, or they could be mid-tribulation rapture or post-tribulation rapture. They're still our brothers and sisters. I have no problem with that. But I don't believe that. I believe that we are, I, I am a pre-tribulation and premillennial. I have been from almost day one by studying the Bible. I, do not, I am not amillennial and I am not postmillennial. That's my eschatology. And my eschatology is simply this. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The earth is not going to get any better. It doesn't make any difference whether you put a Democrat or Republican office. He's not going to make the world better. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to the polls and vote. You should vote your convictions. And you should vote for the one that you think is going to hold up your, your, your convictions as nearest that you can find. And uh, that's what you should do. You should do that as a citizen. You should do that as your responsibility uh, to honor the king that the apostle talks about. But I do not believe for one moment, that we are going to convert the world. My observation is that the world is converting the church. Therefore, the Apostle Paul never makes one mention, not one single mention, of the kingdom of heaven. Number two, the kingdom of heaven is never mentioned. This is important. Not one time, nowhere in the Bible, is the kingdom of heaven ever mentioned in context with the new birth. That's important. The kingdom of God is mentioned in context with the new birth. And the reason the kingdom of God is mentioned in context with the new birth is because it is a spiritual kingdom. And until a man is born again, his spirit is dead. His spirit must be born from above, from the power and the spirit of God, the new birth. He must create anew in you the life of God uh, that was bought for you at the cross at Calvary. Literally, when a person is born again... They are given the life of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and died for you. Therefore, therefore, this is important, the new birth is never mentioned in the Bible in context with the kingdom of heaven. Ask yourself this question tonight. Why not? If the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous, they mean the same thing, the terminolo terminology is interchangeable, there's no difference between the two. Why is the new birth never mentioned in context with the kingdom of heaven? As a matter of fact, you've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Only one Gospel of the four mentions the new birth, and that is John. And when you trace it down, as I've said to you time and again, the Apostle John was the last apostle writing Scripture. All of the other apostles, we have, we, we have reason to believe that when the Apostle John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, that all of the other apostles were gone. They were gone on to glory. And when John penned down the Apocalypse, or the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, he closed the canon of Scripture. He closed it. That finished the book. And when I say the book, I say speak of it in the singular, but it's made up of 66 books, but it's only one book. And he closed it. Therefore... We have a man preaching the new birth, Paul. 
We have Peter preaching the new birth all the way up until the time he's taken from this world. He said, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, of the word of God which liveth and abideth forever, Peter. And we have John preaching the new birth as he wrote it in the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, up until the time that he's taken from this world. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the burden of those three Gospels is not the new birth. The burden of those three Gospels is the kingdom of heaven on this earth. As the King, the Lord Jesus Christ, presented himself as the King of the kingdom of heaven. And that's exactly who he was, who he is, and who he always will be. And the kingdom of heaven will never be on this earth until the King of kings comes. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he will bring the kingdom of heaven with him. And for the first time since the first Adam, there will be one sitting on the throne of the kingdom of heaven who is eminently qualified to rule over a physical, visible, earthly kingdom and also a spiritual kingdom at the same time. The Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, is the king of the kingdom of heaven and he's the king of the kingdom of God, both, and has ever right to be because he is the sinless, perfect son of the living God. This world will not experience the kingdom of heaven until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And according to the book of Revelation, chapter number 11, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He will come and not ask him to give it to him. He will come and take by force that which belongs to him. That's why the heavens open and he comes on a white horse and behold, the heavens are open. Hallelujah to God. And he that sat upon this horse is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So my place in this world today is to preach the gospel of the grace of God. To preach the gospel of the saving grace of God. And to preach the name above every name. And that's the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other name like that blessed, holy, righteous name. And that is to get men and women saved, born again, into the kingdom of God. To go on to be with the Lord, and when he comes back, he'll bring the kingdom of heaven with him. That's a big deal, folks, that the kingdom of heaven is nowhere in the Bible mentioned in context with the new birth. And the Apostle Paul, of course, is hated for that. Number three, the Apostle Paul clearly defines the new birth as it is found in John chapter number three and verse number seven. To Nicodemus in John chapter number 3 and verse number 7. And you've read it many, many times. It's very familiar to you. Here's what your Bible says. In John 3 verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. We call it the new birth. Herbert W. Armstrong, who said he was the only man in the country preaching the truth. <coughs> Four years, he's gone on now. And Ted Armstrong was his son who took up the, I think it's called the Worldwide Church of God, was back then. Uh, he taught that Christ was born again. And here's how he taught it. He taught that Christ was born again at his resurrection. The reason he taught that is because he's smart enough to know that something happened at the resurrection that was a powerful thing. And uh, that's a separate study in itself. I don't want to get off on that. But I just want to mention it to you tonight. That he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Peter said, Who hath begotten us unto a lively hope. Begotten us unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he arose from the dead as this last Adam. He went to the cross as the second man. All the men that ever lived from the first Adam to the Lord Jesus Christ belong in one group. That's the first man. What does that mean, preacher? That means that they were all born under the curse of the first man. Romans 5. Every one of them inherit the fallen nature from first Adam. So that's the first man. But when the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he did not come as a man from the earth. He came as the Lord from heaven. Therefore, he was the second man. Of all of the millions that have lived before and since, there's only two as far as God's concerned. There's the first one and the second one. When he arose from the dead on the third day, he arose from the dead with the same identity that the first Adam had when he was made from the dust of the earth. Except when he arose from the dead on the third day, he arose from the dead as the last Adam. 
Being Adam, all of humanity will live in him. The first Adam brought all of humanity to the earth. The last Adam will bring all of humanity into the presence of God. The first Adam was made a living soul. God breathed into him. He was of the earth, earthy. But the last Adam did not come from this earth. The last Adam came down from above. It's important to remember, and I've said to you time and time again, this is important to understand. Very important. The God-man did not come down from above. God came down from above. But when God came down from above, He merged into a human flesh and became the God-man 2,000 years ago. God had no beginning. The Lord Jesus Christ has never had a beginning. I do not believe in the eternal generation of Christ. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, has always been from everlasting to everlasting. Always. Calvin had a man burned at the stake. Michael Savitas, because he disagreed with Calvin about the idea of the eternal generation of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ did not have a beginning, folks. But the God-man, 2,000 years ago, was the incarnation of God and man. And then he ascended back to the right hand of God the Father. The ascension of Christ to the right hand of God the Father was made possible by his own righteousness. Who would dare ascend into the presence of Almighty God? Who would dare do it? I wouldn't. You wouldn't. But he did. And the reason the Lord Jesus Christ could ascend into the presence of Almighty God is because Christ who came down from above goes back up above as the God-man having lived a sinless, perfect life as a man and having built a righteousness that did not exist until that moment. A righteousness of a man who had lived for 33 and a half years in absolute and complete obedience to the Father. Everything he did, every word he said, all that he was, was in complete obedience to the Father. Therefore, a righteousness was born here on this earth. And that ascended to the right hand of the Father and God received him into his presence. Every, bi every, bi every born again believer today, every one of us. If we are truly saved by the grace of God, the righteousness that you have is not what you can earn, not what you can work out. It is, it is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's how God says to do it. Paul, of course, who's hated, hated so much in Colossians 2, he said, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. And what that means is, in one sense, is put on his righteousness and plead his perfection and sinlessness to cover your soul. And God will bless you for that. Uh, but you have so many self-righteous Baptists today, they spit fire when you talk to them like that. Because they feel like they've earned through their 30 or their 40 or their 50 years of obedience to God all kinds of respect. Because they are righteous in their own eyes. And not so. Every bit of our righteousness is as a filthy rag, and there's not one word in the New Testament that changes that concept. It stays a filthy rag. So the Apostle Paul says, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said that. That's one of the reasons he's hated. One of the reasons he's hated. Paul clearly defines the new birth. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. And uh, Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 12. Let's go back. Verse number 10. Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of the, all principality and power. You remember Wednesday night we talked about the principality and power up in the, up in the other building. We talked about the fact that he created them. They were made by him and for him. Even though they rebel against him, they were still made for him. Are they still for him, preacher? All things are of him, by him, and through him. Nothing exists outside of the permissive will of God. Remember this. 
This absolute, eternal, almighty, invisible being that we serve is almighty God. And he is as far above your mental capacity as the heavens are above the earth. And what we know of him, we only know by the revelation of scripture. And when we try to rely upon our minds to pull God down to our level and conceive him in our own mind, we have done a great disservice to him. Who knows the Father but the Son? Who knows the Son but the Father? That's what he said. The Lord Jesus Christ said, you don't know the Father. And the Father says, you don't know the Son. And so therefore, no man comes to the Father except the Son. And no man comes to the Son, rather, except the Father which has sent him, draw him. This is this revelation of the Godhead. And the Scripture continues in the New Testament and says, this is a mystery. The mystery of God. And it says during the tribulation period, right here on this earth, that the mystery of God will be revealed. I want to see that. I want to see that. We all know tonight that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But that doesn't reveal the mystery of God. What is that mystery? It's the one who breathed into your nostrils the breath of life, and you became a living soul. And all we know in this world are human beings and the Holy Spirit that indwells us. We will know Him as He is one day. And it will be infinitely above us. Verse 12 said, Buried with Him in baptism, when also you risen with Him through the faith. Now watch what it's called. Of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now notice carefully here, in verse 10, verse 11, In whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without, in, made without hands, in doing what? In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In plainer words, he said, when God saved you and bore birth to you into the kingdom of God, he literally separated your body from your soul and spirit. That's what he said. <laughs> and you, 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 I'll tell you what, right, you're at pain to hear that preached anywhere. And, but I'm not original with that. There's a lot of people that preach that. But that's quite a concept. And being that, you begin to understand now, if that's, you know, that concept gives you an idea then, of the, of the, of the, mul of the multiple nature of a, of a, of a, of a Bible believer and a born again believer. Say by the grace of God, a body, a soul, and a spirit. And the body's been put off. I'm no longer attached to it, stuck to it, bound by it, judged by it. I am different Amen. by the new birth. Amen. They hate Paul for that. They hate him. In the book of Romans chapter number 11... They, this is the fourth reason they hate Paul, because he tells you what is going to happen to the Jew. Romans chapter number 11 and verse number 26. Romans, the book of Romans is the Magna Carta of the grace of God. That's what it is. It's the Magna Carta of the grace of God. It is the constitution of the grace of God. In the 11th chapter of Romans in verse number 26... And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And he said, This is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, lest there be any doubt in anyone's mind, as concerning the gospel, they are, present tense, enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that the Old Testament prophets looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, prophesied of his day? The Apostle Peter said they prophesied of things that they did not understand, and they prophesied of things that did not come to that did not full, that were not fulfilled in their lifetime, nor even apply to them, and but they prophesied it anyway because there would be a come a time when they would when it would apply. And that's the time that we're in now. The Old Testament prophet prophesied of that. He looked forward to that. All right? But he also talked about the restoration of Israel. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 11, he said, I will stretch forth my hand the second time. The second time to bring you back, to call you back into your land. He's done it one time. He's already done it the first time. The first time is recorded in Scripture. When they came back after 70 years of Babylonian captivity, they came back to the land. They came back in stages. That's what the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther are about. They came back in stages. Uh, they came back in stages, but this second uh, aliyah, that's what the term they use, is where they come back 
And God's outstretched arm, he brings his people into the land. May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up and said, This day, after I don't know how many thousands of years, Israel is now once again a nation. He announced it to the world that they're a nation. And the United States, under Harry Truman, uh, recognized them. So did uh, uh, Russia and others. They had become, after all these years, a nation. The second time he reached out his hand and brought him back. The hot spot of the world is not Washington, D.C. The hot spot is Jerusalem. You live in a privileged generation tonight because you, you are witness to the fulfillment of prophecy of thousands of years old. You're witness to it. He stretched forth his hand a second time. The prophet of the Old Testament prophesied of Israel's salvation. The Savior would come. But 2,000 years ago when he came, they rejected him. And so now the established church for 2,000 years has been preaching what's called replacement theology. What's replacement theology? It's when they say that the church has replaced Israel and that Israel is cursed forever. And so therefore they take all of the blessings and grace and mercy of God and apply it to themselves and call themselves the Israel of God. British Israelism, as I told you in Sunday school this morning. You remember I talked about Cecil Rhodes. How many remember Cecil Rhodes? Rhodesia, Rhodes Scholarship, Bill Clinton, and the, the I can't remember his name, the uh, Greek uh, up there on TV, Stephanopoulos, and others, many of them have Rhodes scholarships. And Cecil Rhodes started a, a one-world government push in Great Britain. Remember, Great Britain, whose symbol is a lion, to bring about a one-world government through Great Britain. Do you know what is the mother country to our country? Great Britain. Don't ever let anybody flim-flam you. America, its mother country to America is Great Britain. We, are, we were the original colonies of King George. And so Great Britain would be the vehicle, would bring about a one-world government. All right. Now, why would they want a one-world government? Why would they push for a government here on this earth? Because they're kingdom builders. And they can merge religion, replace Israel, push them out of the way, and build their basileus or their basilicas. They can bring all this stuff together and seat their pope or seat their ruler on that seat and rule over the world. That's why I reject British Israelism in all of its forms. The Jew has been blinded, but he's going to save them. Amen. Hath God cast away his people which he foreknew? That's how the 11th chapter of Romans starts. God forbid. God forbid. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and all the rest of those Old Testament prophets prophesied of the salvation of the Jew. God will save them. And then finally, finally, the last reason that they hate Saul of Tarsus is because his conversion is a pattern for those that should hereafter believe on him. Look at 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 16. In verse 15, he said, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners, of whom I used to be. Am I dumb myself? Of whom I am chief, right? Now look at verse 16. How be it, now watch carefully, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy. Now watch carefully, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Amen. 
Now, you ladies have ever made dresses and things like that and use patterns. You lay it down, cut out a piece of cloth according to the pattern. I used to mess around with woodworking. No woodworker measures every piece of a board if he's making a table, something of that nature atop. He measures one, sets up his, sets up his stop and his fence, and then every board is cut exactly the same. There's no way you can measure every one of them, but you set it up like that. Every one of them are exactly the same length. That's a pattern. All kinds of patterns can be used. In other words, it is something that produces many, many more after itself. So the Apostle Paul said, the way I got saved is the way he's going to save all the rest that come after me. Now here's how he got saved. The Lord Jesus Christ went into the very hell that Paul was in and spoke to him. This is important. He does not raise up a religious edifice and reach out and say, come in here now. You know, you feel the need for religion or some experience, come on in here. No. He will go into the very whorehouse. He will go into the very bar. He will go into the very depths of whatever your sin. He will. Not me. He will. I'm limited by space and time. Holy Ghost is not. He will go to you where you are in whatever you are in and convict you. And then he'll draw you out of that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He'll draw you out of that. I just read the conversation in the book of Acts chapter number 9. You will have a personal encounter with God. There will be a time in your life, you may forget the date, you may forget the time of the day, but you'll never forget the fact that there's a time in your life when you come face to face with a personal encounter with God. And you'll leave there born again. That's what happened to Paul. He was born again. And then the Lord told Ananias, He's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, the Gentiles. And the scales fell from his eyes. And he said, I'm going to show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. They hate Paul for that. Most mainline Protestant churches do not preach the new birth. The emerging church does not preach the new birth. The Roman Catholic Church does not preach the new birth. To them, the new birth is a process. It's not an event. The new birth to these people means that the church ministers graces to you, and the graces that the church ministers to you are means of salvation. Therefore, they hold within their power the salvation of your soul. And if they excommunicate you, then they send you to hell. Now, that's a horrible thing to hold over someone's head. Did you know how many people that go to church every Sunday didn't know a thing about it when God saved me? But when I walked out of that living room that night, I was a new man. Ah, something had profound had happened to me. I had changed. I knew something was inside me that wasn't in there before. It was profound. It was a wonderful experience. I was saved. I was born again. And it hasn't done anything but get better since then. Amen. It's lasted since 1973. That's 42 years. Born again. Hallelujah to God. Born of the Spirit of God. But you cannot be born again without a personal confrontation with God. It has to take place. Well... I'm not one of the elect. Preacher didn't die for me. The Bible said he tasted death for every man. Don't try to argue about election. Forget that. The scripture says that he's the savior of all men, especially those that believe. That's what it says. There's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul therefore said, look at how I got saved. That's how the rest are going to get saved. Have you ever had a personal encounter with God? If you ever do, you'll never forget it. 
You'll never forget it. You'll never forget it. And here's what and here's what'll happen to you too. You ever have a personal encounter with him and you're born again? Uh, you may not set about to be an ins- religious, uh, a spiritual inspector, but it's going to happen because you're going to meet people that go to church and and smile and shake hands and and very religious. And deep inside your spirit and your soul, something just says there's something wrong here. There's something wrong. Something wrong. Something bad wrong. I've heard preachers get up in the pulpit, well trained, smart, deliver good delivery, but there's just something wrong. Something wrong. A fellow out there in Houston, Texas, got the biggest church in the whole country. He just said the other day, he said, "There's nothing wrong with sodomy." But paraphrasing, you know, I can't speak verbatim, but it's there. It's all over the internet. Nothing wrong with sodomy. He'd been asked before about it. Homosexuality. He's got all these people sitting there. Now here's the problem. Got two problems. Problem number one. If you're going to that church and you know he said that and you sit there in that church, then let me tell you something. You've never met God. You've never had an encounter with him. All right. If there is any witness in that church, they should immediately empty the pews. Walk out the door, and he may be left with three or four hundred out of thousands. But that's not going to happen. Number two, he should get on his face and repent and come on nationwide television and say, I have blasphemed this holy name, and what I said is dead wrong. That I am truly born again, and what I said is wrong, God forgive me, then I would consider the fact that he may be born again. But don't expect it to happen. Say, why? The love of money is the root of all evil. Do you have any idea how much money passes through a place that big? A lot of money. A lot of money. I hope you've met him. I really do. I hope you've met him. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'd use what I've said tonight. And bless it, Lord. And bless everyone that's come out and those that will hear this later, those who heard it tonight over the Internet. I pray that you'd bless your word. And, Father, may it take root in our heart. May it build a firm foundation in our soul. As to who we are and what we believe. In thy holy name I pray. And amen. Let's stand up.